Yeah, welcome to the first lecture on post-quantum cryptography. So let's jump right in and motivate why we need to care about post-quantum cryptography, namely why we are concerned about quantum computers. Now, in 2018, the National Academy of Sciences from the US did a lot of uh, interviews with people building quantum computers, people developing things for quantum computers like operating system or languages, uh, quantum algorithms, and of course also some cryptographers. And then they published a report with their key findings and also a lot of details on these key findings. And there are 10 key findings. Now the first key finding, which I'd like to translate as or paraphrase as don't panic, is saying, given the current state of quantum computing and recent rates of progress, it is highly in unexpected that a quantum computer that can compromise RSA 2048 or comparable discrete logarithm-based public key crypto systems will be built within the next decade. So what this is saying is that the crypto systems that you probably have heard of before this course, namely RSA based on factorization and then discrete logarithms, that would be fine field differ Hellman or elliptic curve cryptography, that those are unlikely to be broken within the next 10 years at least not with a quantum computer. So um, to break those with the algorithms that we know at the moment would require a rather large and rather stable quantum computer. And the, the opinion of the experts is that it's at least 10 years till we have one. So lean back, wait for 10 years. Well, they also ramp up to key finding 10, which I'd like to paraphrase as panic, which is, even if a quantum computer that can decrypt current cryptographic ciphers is more than a decade off, the hazard of such a machine is high enough and the time frame for transitioning to a new security protocol is sufficiently long and uncertain that privatization of the development, standardization and deployment of post quantum cryptography is critical for minimizing the chance of a potential security and privacy disaster. So your job in taking this course is to protect the world against, well, a potential security and privacy disaster. So this is something in a very official publication. So this is not said lightly. So why is the advent of a quantum computer such a big deal to cryptography? Let's start by putting the time frame, these 10 years. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? So one problem is that for confidentiality, so for keeping the contents of the messages uh, secret, we are already in trouble now because, well, if the attacker is storing your communication for today, so if you're sending something with PGP today, or if you're visiting a web page uh, with HTTPS, then you are using cryptography, and unless something went wrong, we do believe that this cryptography is secure for the moment. So the attacker goes like, oh darn, I can't read this. However, attackers might record your messages and might be optimistic that sometime in the future they will be able to break it. And quantum computers have this guarantee of, yes, once a physical thing is there, once physicists and engineers have gotten um, their research done and the manufacturing done, then definitely all the currently used public key cryptography will be broken. And that means that if your data is still interesting at that point, and if you're a human rights worker or you're a journalist talking with sensitive sources, then 10 years is not such a long time frame. So also if you, well, have to uh, protect medical records or state secrets, 10 years is normally not what you're expecting. You're expecting 30 or 40 or 50 years for those. And that means um, we are potentially already in trouble today with the messages we're sending, at least if the quantum computer comes within the time frame. And I used to be given these talks, like what I just said, well, if an attacker is storing the data. Now, 2013, Snowden came with his revelations, and the picture you see on the right here, the X key score slide, that is giving us the certainty that some attackers, and the same is probably true for every nation state, at least the bigger ones, are sufficiently interested in the communication that they do record everything they get. And they can get it. You see each of those red dot is a listening point or interception point. So they have um, tabs at the big ISPs 
they have tabs at the undersea cable that come up at the coast of Britain there, and so they get all traffic. Now, if your traffic is not encrypted, they read it and they store it, because it could be interesting at some point. If your tra traffic is encrypted, they can't read it, so definitely encrypt, and they will store it for future use. And they have a lot of storage. On the next slide, I have a picture of the Bluffdale Muter Center, uh, where you can see a gigantic place where they store your data. So that is also not something where you can out outpace them. But let me first comment on signature schemes. So signature schemes typically matter the moment that you verify the signature and act upon it. So if somebody sends you an operating system update, you will check that the signature is valid at that moment, then update the system, and you don't care about the validity of the signature afterwards. So if in 2021 you're getting a good signature and you believe that right now there is nobody with a quantum computer, well, it's at least 10 years off, then this good signature is actually saying that the update you got is valid. And so you could say, well, let's lean back and let's wait till the quantum computer is there, then we can update our signature systems. Now, there are two problems with this. The first one is pretty obvious. We won't actually get a notification saying, oops, the NSA has built a quantum computer. You should upgrade your uh, signature system now. At some point, we will know that public, publicly operating scientists and companies have built a quantum computer, but that is fairly likely much later than nation states have built quantum computers. The other issue is, well, how do you then change the signature system? I said before that when we upgrade systems, we check the signature. But if we're now updating the system because all signatures are broken, then anybody could send us a malicious update because at that moment, they can break the signature key and so they can send us anything they want with a valid signature. So we also have to already move on with changing the signatures to post quantum signatures. So it's not enough to say, okay, well, we do confidentiality now, so we move to post quantum encryption and keep signatures for later. We also have to have a path to rolling out signatures, at least for upgrades, long before quantum computers are there. Yeah, so here's the uh, promised picture of Bluffdale Muter. Uh, you can see for scale, there are some cars in the front uh, left next to the building, and there are also some humans and they're really tiny in comparison to these buildings. So these are huge buildings. Um, the NSA said it's a data center and it would be for storage of data. It would not be for computation. Um, another thing for scale is that this um, center has its own 65 megawatts power substation. And again, they're not saying it's for computation, it's just for storing. So you can be sure that all interesting data will have a copy in that building. And that is just one of the buildings that we know of. There are certainly more buildings in the US, and there are also certainly more buildings in other countries. Now, I will be using the following picture to symbolize the quantum computer to show you how kind of scary and dangerous it is. But quantum computers actually look like this. This is the Google executive showing off his new quantum computer. It's a cute little baby quantum computer this latest. And it's happy this bright red and blue and a bit of gold, like it's, it's happy Google colors, so it looks totally innocent. And so you might go like, hey, look, nice quantum computer, can't possibly do anything bad. But he's actually pretty aware that this has implications for security. And that's a rare thing. Most people building quantum computers say, well, they're doing this for the common good, they're doing it for having better fertilizer, for having better medicine. But he actually leaned out and gave an interview to the Telegraph, and they found it surprising enough that they put this in the in the caption of this article. Namely, he said that quantum computing um, will break encryption as we know it today, and he's even saying in a five to ten year time frame. So he's more optimistic about the building of a quantum computer being close than the National Academy of Sciences. Of course, that is advertisement speech, but I found it very interesting that he's saying, "Yeah, we're breaking encryption and." We're aware of it and we don't see this problem. Now he's not saying, oh yeah, the crypto community is dealing with post quantum photography, so it's a solved problem and there's no ethical issue in building a big quantum computer. 
which is putting uh, a lot of pressure on us and hence you to actually learn post-con photography and to make sure that well those guys pushing ahead will not uh, bring a security and privacy disaster so where are we now so if our alice and bob want to send a message then they send this over the internet so there's some untrust network and any agency in the world and any government in the world can intercept those. And the job of cryptography is to make sure that this is okay. Eve gets a copy of the encrypted data and she can't do anything. She can store it for later, but nothing else. Now all of our communication or essentially all of our communication uses a mix of symmetric cryptography and public key cryptography. And I've just written here a few names, just the name job, and some of those should be familiar to you if you have taken a cryptography course before this one. So the typical way that a connection starts is that Alice and Bob know each other by their public keys, or maybe they have to follow some certificates or some signatures to be sure that they talk to the right person. And then the conversation starts with Alice sending a public key encryption or the Verhalman key exchange part to Bob. And then Bob replies with something which is related to this public key encryption, basically confirming that yes, he has received the key that Alice wants to use for this encryption. Afterwards, the bulk of the data is all using symmetric key cryptography. So the, the payload, so the contents are being encrypted and authenticated with systems in the upper part of the slide, but the key exchange at the beginning, obtaining the symmetric key, that is using public key cryptography, and also reaching the right party, making sure that Alice is talking to Bob and not to Eve. And because everything is starting with public key cryptography, if we now toss in the quantum computer into this mix, and well, as you can see here in red indicated, quantum computers break everything we're currently using for systems unless you have some very exotic um, development system which is using post-quantum cryptography, everything else is using pre-quantum crypto, everything else gets broken. And that means that the handshake message, the initial message which is generating this key or agreeing on this key is broken. And then even though quantum computers do not really affect the metric key cryptography, it is still all broken because, well, the attacker or quantum Eve here gets the key for the symmetric key cryptography from breaking the public key crypto. And so our main job and what I'm going to focus on for this part of the lectures is to replace the bottom red part here with post-quantum system. So to give you a uh, short definition of what post-quantum cryptography is, that is cryptography on the assumption that the attacker has a quantum computer. And it's kind of important that it's the attacker has a quantum computer not the user. So the user having quantum computer is a much, much further future. And so what we have to deal with right now, what this problem we have to solve is that today we are encrypting messages, we are sending data, which eventually will be readable by an attacker who then has a quantum computer. We might consider that the attacker is active and has a quantum computer. So post-quantum cryptography also has to protect against active attacks by a quantum Eve. But for now, the main concern is, well, we're sending systems from this bottom part there, or, well, those quantum systems hopefully soon. And the attacker will later on with the quantum computer try to break. Now the topics that we'll cover and also the, well, categories of mathematical problems, which we believe to be hard for quantum computers, so the mathematical problems we study in post-quantum public key cryptography are based on error correcting codes, hash functions, isogeny graphs, lattices, or multivariate quadratic equations. Now, these are mathematical problems, and we will look into how they're defined and, well, find out what the best attacks are that we know at the moment, but it's not a guarantee that if somebody takes one of these assumptions, and even if they understand what size they have to choose so that it's hard to compute, it does not mean that the resulting crypto system is actually secure.
quite often it happens that when you turn a heart problem into an encryption system or a signature system, that the attacker can circumvent the heart problem, that they can read the encrypted messages or they can forge a signature even though they do not break the problem. So we'll also look into some cases which are based on heart problems but do not achieve security, unfortunately. More of that in the next lecture.